Acts chapter 2, verse 1. Okay? If you're taking notes. Come on, we encourage note-taking here. Uh, so grab a pen. You're going to want to jot some things down to, today. I'm going to uh, hopefully um, shed some light on a few things and, uh, and teach you guys a little bit. We'll grow together, so you might want to write a few things down. Uh, if, you're gonna, if you're taking notes, you jot down the title today, Once Upon a Time. Week three of our, last week actually, of our series, Follow the Leader, where we've been looking at the last two weeks, what does it look like to become the godly leader that, that we're supposed to become? What does it look like? What are some of the key components to becoming a leader worth following? And so today we're going to kind of wrap all that up, give you one more um, thing that we think is super important in our journey of becoming the leaders that God's called us to be. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. Real quick, just slap your neighbor a high five and just say, man, you make spring break look so good. Just tell him. you got to tell him real quick. You make it look good. Good. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. Here we go. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, 120 people gathered together in one mind and one accord. Everybody say one mind and one accord. Come on. Let's go. When suddenly a sound from heaven filled the whole building. Then like wildfire, the Holy Spirit spread through their ranks. Well, that escalated quickly. Hey, would you pray with me one more time this morning, and then we'll, uh, we'll get into this. God, thanks so much for these, these moments. We, we don't take them for granted. We are truly from our hearts thankful for them. And we ask that today you, by your Holy Spirit, would capitalize on these few moments we have together as we open your Bible, as we open your book, as we uh, dig into what your heartbeat is for our lives. We ask today that, that you would make entrance into the lives of your people. Holy Spirit, let your presence just absolutely fill this place in a tangible, felt way, God, until people's lives are transformed by the power of Jesus' name. Come on, if you believe it this morning, somebody say amen. So, real quick question this morning. Do we have any parents in the house this morning who have a favorite time of day? It's called a magical little time called bedtime. Come on, where's all the parents at? Let's go. Come on, if you can relate, just tell your neighbor, say bedtime is the best time. Come on, just tell them. Yeah, it is. Me and my wife, Brooke, who is homesick today with a couple of our other sick kids, pray for us. Uh, but in case you don't know who we are, uh, we have four kids. We did it to ourselves. We're not going to try to pass the blame. We maybe, maybe not took the verse about be fruitful and multiply a little too seriously. It's how we got here, okay? Too much information, thanks. Anybody who has multiple kids can relate to this. Does it seem like, for all the families who have multiple kids, big, big families, does it seem like we're more of a mob and less of a family at times? Anybody? Like, like it's always funny when we try to go out to eat as a family, the horror in the wait staff's face when my family kicks open the door of the Chinese buffet, right? Like, I think I've legitimately seen a waitress quit a time or two. Like, she looked at my kids, just took off her apron, threw it on the register, and walked out, Okay. Not going to lie, I'm like, I'm watching this all play out and thinking in my mind, like, you made the right move, okay? You made the right move because it's just a lot. That's my people, my group, my family. Now, just to say this before I continue, I love my kids, okay? I love them a lot. But come about 745-ish, there are many nights when I could just about kill a kid or two and all the parents said, come on, help me out up here. That's why in our house, bedtime is at the same time every night, 8 p.m., no questions asked, 8 p.m., brush your teeth, go, go to the bathroom, grab a book, it's time for bed. It's the best time. It's bedtime. Now, does any parents do the, the read your kiddos a bedtime story thing before they go to bed? Anybody? Come on. Good parents in the house, right? Have you ever, I don't know if you can relate to this, have you ever read one of those kids' bedtime stories to your kiddos and, and wondered to yourself, like, who in the world thought it would be a good idea to turn this story into a story for small children before bed. For instance, ladybug, ladybug, fly away home. Your house is on fire. Your children are gone. No potential for nightmares there. Like, our house just caught on fire and the kids are watching Stranger Things on Netflix, okay? It's like, I met an old lady who swallowed a fly. I don't know why she swallowed a fly. Perhaps she'll die. Another heartwarming image for the kids before bed. 
Hey, you know what, kid? Let's forget the book tonight and let's just watch Lord of the Flies instead, okay? Stephen King, just tuck our kids in. I'll make popcorn. What about like if you, it was the Sleeping Beauty? You ever read that one? It's like the girl passes out, the guy starts kissing her. You know, it's like, why don't we just turn on an episode of Cops and watch the bad guy get tased for sexual harassment? You're going to jail. Last but not least, rub a dub dub. You know, three men in a tub. Thanks for that mental picture. The only thing that can make that any more inappropriate is if they're lathering each other up, okay? Like, good night, kids. Once upon a time, it's uh, lands of enchantment. It's amazing acts of bravery. It's incredible feats of heroism. It's superpowers and the unexplainable. It's impossible odds being overcome. It's courage in the face of raging opposition. But... But when the story's over and the book's closed, it, it was fun unicorn vibes, but not so real lives, right? It's the concept that we kind of want to surround for the next few moments this morning. And as we take a look together at an event that took place in the New Testament that almost reads like a once upon a time story. It's found in the book of Acts. We just read, read Acts chapter 2. And so I want to give you the big idea. Here's what we're going to base our time around in our Bible study here, the, the big idea. The Bible is more than some cool stories. It's supposed to become our story, right? And it can be easy, can it, uh, because of the extraordinary nature of the Bible to read the Bible with kind of like a fairy tale. It's a beautiful unicorn, but we all know unicorns aren't real, Uh uh, the incredible feats, the extraordinary acts, the unparalleled character and nobility we see in the book of Acts and throughout in Scripture, it's more than a beautiful unicorn, church. It's a blueprint. It's a blueprint. It's not just a cool story for them once upon a time. It's actually supposed to be for us right now in our time. Are you guys following me? So personally, like I have to believe that if we can learn how to do what the New Testament church did, then we can get the results that they got, right? And as we'll see in our short time in the book of Acts, the same experience that launched them into existence in Acts 2, it's the same thing that carried them throughout the book of Acts and beyond. It, this is the X factor, okay? This is the, the common denominator the, that made life-changing leadership the exception not the norm. I mean, the norm, not the exception. Following me? People being encouraged and strengthened in their walk with God. Miracles and signs and wonders. People coming to Jesus by the thousands, right? The church growing and expanding. Cities being impacted and transformed. It was not the exception. Like, it was the norm. You got to read the book of Acts. Now, understand, like, that kind of large-scale uh, impact that the early church was a part of, it doesn't happen without large-scale leadership, right? Large-scale leadership. So we're looking at what, is it, what does it mean to become the leader that God's called us to be? It's, it's what we believe here at Destiny Church. Everybody's a leader. Everybody is leading somebody. Just because you don't have a microphone and a message and a pulpit doesn't mean you're not a leader. Every person in this room is leading somebody, right? And our hearts is that every person God's called you to be a leader, but that every person is having a large-scale impact in the world around them. Right? Even if your world may seem small and insignificant, that you're still making a large-scale impact in your world through becoming the leader that God has called and equipped you to become. If we'll follow the blueprint of great leaders, then we can get the breakthrough of great leaders. You following me? Okay. So we're going to take a look at the foundation this morning, the, the beginning, the catalyst that kind of like launched the New Testament church into a lifestyle of life-changing leadership. How many wants to become the leader that God's created them to be? Anybody in the room this morning? All right, good. And I believe that, um, you know, if we can lay the foundation that they did then, then we are on our way to their quality of leadership now, right? So what was, it begs the, the question, what was the very first experience that um, began 
and also became the common thread of a group of people that God commissioned to lead the New Testament community. What was it? Where's a good place for us to start? Like, yes, okay, I want to be the leader God's called me to be. Where is a good place for me to start in my journey of becoming a leader of the same quality as the leaders in the Bible? Where's a good place to start? I think a good place to start for us is is where they started then. Right? Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, 120 people were gathered together in one mind and one accord when suddenly a sound from heaven filled the whole building. Think about that. Right? This was the launch day event of the New Testament church. Right? Jesus had not too long ago in front of many of their eyes um, uh, ascended to the right hand of the Father, ascended up into heaven to be seated at the right hand of the Father after his death and resurrection. But before Jesus drops the mic and walks off stage one last time, his parting words to his crew in Acts chapter 1 were, do not, guys, do not under any circumstance leave Jerusalem, but wait there until you receive the Holy Spirit. Don't go anywhere. Don't do anything until you get that, right? Don't attempt to do anything for God until you first, guys, have an encounter with God. Because godly, life-changing leaders grow best in the soil of time spent in God's life-changing presence, right? What we just read in Acts chapter 2 is that moment that Jesus told his disciples to wait for. This is that moment, right, when suddenly a sound from heaven filled the whole building. Listen, what launched the New Testament church then is the same thing that will grow and sustain the church now, right? The presence of God. It was, this is so important, so central to the heart of God. It made it into his parting speech. Do not pass go. Do not collect $100 until you have this. It's what Moses, the great leader of the Old Testament, says in Exodus 33, when God says, hey, Moses, I want you to lead the children of Israel. I want you to, I want you to lead them into the promised land. And here's what Moses' response was. Hey, God, I, if your presence doesn't go with me, if your presence doesn't go with me, I'm out. I'm not going anywhere. Because Moses understood if he's going to lead effectively, he has to stay planted in the presence of God. Are you all following me? For us to become the parents, where's all the parents in the house? We all want to lead our families into spiritual maturity, right? For us to become the parents that lead our families there, we have to stay planted in the presence of God. For us to become the businessmen and women that lead our companies into biblical prosperity and blameless prosperity for the sake of the kingdom, the way it's supposed to, we got to stay engaged in the presence of God. For you to become the the student that carries 15 plus hours and a full-time job with a joy in your heart that shows the people around you, the God that's in you, you have to stay planted in the presence of God, right? Right? We can't do what we're supposed to do or become the leaders we're supposed to become outside of time spent in God's presence, right? If God's presence isn't going with me, well, then I'm not going. It's our greatest treasure, beloved. It's our portion and our inheritance. It's our good thing. It's our safe refuge. It's the presence of God where there's fullness of joy. At his right hand, there's pleasures forevermore. If your presence doesn't go with me, I'm not going. It's, I'm out. So, what does that mean? Now, now, bear with me. I'm just kind of teaching you guys a little bit, giving you some history here. So, but what does that mean? Like, I thought God was always present. Anybody else think that? I thought he was all, everywhere at all times. I thought, I thought that was it. And if that's true, and God's present everywhere at all times, why would Moses say, if you don't go, if your presence doesn't go with me, I'm not going? Well, the answer is yes. God is omnipresent, okay, which means, it's a big word that basically means he's everywhere at all times, okay? He's here right now. He'll be with you in your car when you get in your car. When you go to the restaurant with your family, he'll be there. He's everywhere at all times, okay? He's omnipresent. That's why the psalmist says, where can I hide from your spirit? Where can I go from your presence? He's everywhere at all times, okay? But Moses 
wasn't talking about the omnipresence of God in Exodus. If he was, why did he say, if your presence doesn't go with me, I'm not going? It's because Moses was talking about the manifest presence of God. So there's a difference. Okay? So, you guys follow me? Let's say in the room right now, sitting in here today, there is a multi-billionaire sitting somewhere in this room. His presence would be among us, right? Now, let's say he got up and he began to do what only a multi-billionaire could do as he started walking through the room and handing each person in this room a million dollars. He would be manifesting his presence. You following me? He would be making his presence known. Now, let's just pause for a second. See if there's a multi-billionaire that wants to be in manifesting his presence and make it rain up in here. You, are you get what I'm saying? It's one thing to just have him in the room. It's another thing altogether to have him make his presence known in a way that nobody else can. Come on. God will always be present in this room every time we come together. In your lives, he will be present every moment of every day. But what we want to begin to desire, church, what we want to begin to expect as followers of Christ is for those moments where God stands up and he makes his presence known like only he can to manifest his presence. This was the catalyst that uh, launched the New Testament church, the manifest presence of of God. It's that felt experience where suddenly a sound from heaven, it filled the whole building. It was the power of God making his presence known to these men and women that began to launch them into the next season of leadership in their lives. Creating an environment that's welcoming to the presence of God. Learning how to host the presence of God. It was at the very top of the priority list of the New Testament church, and it should be at the top of the priority list in today's church, right? Yet somewhere down the line, it's like, it's like somewhere down the line in church history, the focus of our corporate gatherings has become the sermon rather than hosting the presence of the Holy Spirit. Now, that in no way, shape, or form is to, like, imply the Bible is any less important at all. They preach the good news then, we're going to do that until Jesus returns. That's just what we're going to do. But we do realize that the New Testament church didn't even have the New Testament, right? All they had was the Old Testament and the presence of God, right? And I, I just think it would be really easy to get it wrong when we put more emphasis on a book they didn't have than we do on the presence they, they did have. Come on, church, anybody still awake out there? Spring break? I get it. It's human tendency 101, though. Like, I want to become the leader that God's called me to be. I want to lead my family the right way. So I'm going to get some principles. I'm going to get some practices. Like, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to get some, some, some to, a to-do list going. Right? Show me, show me the scriptures so I can start doing that. That's all fine. But in the pursuit of getting all the answers, sometimes we have a tendency to forget that an encounter with the answer is worth more than all the answers, right? Like, the, the, we realize the goal of the Bible is not to know the Bible, right? Right? The goal of the Bible is to put us into position to encounter the author, right? And when we put more emphasis, it's easy to do, I've done it, you've done it, we've all done it. When we put more emphasis on practices and principles of the Bible than we do the presence, we, we get, it's a dangerous place because we can tend to become disciples that know God in theory, but not in reality. So our hearts, you know, as your pastors, I, I just want to just try to plant a seed today. Would you let me just maybe plant a seed in your heart and let's see where it goes from there. A seed that I, hopefully it turns into this burning desire to experience for yourself the same manifest presence of God they experienced at Acts then. It's what launched them into greater, greater leadership then, and it's, good, it's a good enough place for us to start now. So I want to just take just a few more moments. You guys got a few moments? I got just one quick challenge. So what, is, so what does it look like? God's made this available. We realize that's for our, if it's for today. It's not a once upon a time story. It's for this time. So what can I do to get myself in position to, to receive 
like they received in the book of Acts. What, what can I do? Give me one thing. Let me just give you one thing. And you might want to write this down if you're taking notes. Expectation is preparation. Expectation is preparation. Acts chapter 1, verse 3. Now check this out, and I referenced this earlier. In face-to-face meetings, Jesus talked to the disciples about things concerning the kingdom of God. This is right before he's about to ascend to heaven to be seated at the right hand of the Father. Okay? So he's talking to his disciples as they met. Jesus told them that they were on no account. Guys, don't leave Jerusalem at all, but here's what I want you to do. Wait for what the Father promised. Wait. Wait for what the Father promised. Now, quick question. You guys ever realize how, like, expectation has this incredible potential to, like, make a moment? Anybody? Like, like it works both ways. You, uh, you have high expectations, and those expectations don't get met. Every guy can relate to that. Valentine's Day, right? <laughs> but by far, guilty, but by far, the best is when you have these monumental expectations, right? They're monumental, and then those expectations get met and then exceeded. Anybody ever had that? It's the best, right? It's the best. It, it reminds me of something that happened a couple weeks ago on our local news channel, KY3, is the place to be. You may have seen it. Uh, it's where Ethan Foreheads, if you don't know who that is, he's the, co- the lead anchor in KY3. He sets up his co-anchor to take the lead on a story. Yeah, you can feel the expectation right now, can't you? But he doesn't tell her that this particular story has a punchline, okay? And you can tell, like, there's so much anticipation going on inside Ethan's heart <laughs> or whatever, that when what he expected to happen actually happened, it was, like, so much better than he could have ever imagined. Like, he can't even contain himself, right? So in case you have no idea what we're talking about, I would do you, be doing you a major injustice if I didn't just show you what we're talking about right now. Check this out. Customers at a Kansas Home Depot. Police responded to reports of a bomb threat at the store in Wichita. A customer alerted employees. A man inside the bathroom said there was a bomb in the building. Police were able to locate the man responsible for those comments, and that man told police he warned other guests to leave the restroom because he was, quote, uh, fixing to blow it up, but had no intention of causing a panic. Man also told police others in the room laughed understanding his joke, which I'm just now getting. (laughs) Home Depot says they will not be pressing charges. But I can tell you right now, you asked the producer for me to read that, didn't you? (laughs) To Ethan now, please. No. (laughs) Are we going to have to go to a commercial? No, we're going to get it. We're going to get it. We're, we can do this. <clears throat> All right. Uh, turning now to an impassioned plea in a string of thefts. Uh, police are searching for several thieves believed to have stolen a 400-year-old bonsai tree. <laughs> the missing tree seen here st- <laughs> stands about three feet uh, tall and two and a half feet wide. <laughs> With more than 400 points and branches. It is, it is. <laughs> oh man. It is green with a brownish curved trunk that tilts a bit to the side, as you can see. Come on, look at your neighbor and tell him KY3 is the place to be. Come on, tell him. Tell him. Expectation makes the moment, right? I wonder how you. So I want you to think about this in your own personal life. Just think about this. I wonder how you would answer this question. What did you expect when you walked through the doors of the church this morning? What did you expect? Right? There would be a variety of answers, no doubt. But I, I wonder if a lot of our answers would be some variation of, well, I'm not sure. Not sure. There was... Mad amounts of expectation in that upper room in Acts. Jesus told them that they were not to do anything or go anywhere but to wait for the Father's promise. I would venture to say that there were not many casual attendees present at that gathering. 
The atmosphere, it, it must have been charged and electric with, ex, with the expectation of those who had gathered together. They were believing with everything in their hearts that God was about to show up and do something huge. It's why the Bible says that they were in one mind and one accord. You, you see? It's what put a demand, their expectation is what put a demand on what was available in the moment and brought it into the present. Right? Their expectation, it became the environment that for God to show up and do what only God can do to manifest his presence, to make himself known. So if I can give you guys one thing and just sow the seed and then whatever it grows into, it grows into. One thing to desire and hunger for every time you walk through the doors of church, it would be that God would make his presence known among us to manifest his presence, to stand up and do what only he can do, right? Is there going to be fellowship and community? Absolutely. They did it in the New Testament church. We're going to do it until Jesus returns. Is there going to be great programs? Is there going to be great preaching? Absolutely. But if that's all we expect when we come into church, it's probably all we're going to get, church, right? And if, if we get all those things, but we don't have God showing up in our midst and manifesting himself the way that only he can. We don't win. We lose. Right? Like, like God can see. He can see when we come into his house uh, because that's what the family does at the end of a busy work week because that's what we do. He can see that. He's not mad about that at all, but I do think it limits his activity in our lives because there was no expectation in our hearts, you hear? Right? Versus when we come together and our hearts and we are in one mind and we are in one accord, the followers of Jesus Christ that have been bought by his blood, that the hearts that are longing and burning and desiring for authentic, life-changing encounter with God, that, that affects our worship, that affects our engagement, it creates space. For the presence of God to come and do what only he can do. It, Psalm, Psalms 82, verse 4. Maybe the psalmist can give us some better words for this. My soul yearns. Wow, I wonder if, if you've ever had that experience in your soul. My soul yearns. Even faints. You, you ever experience that? Maybe not. For the courts of the Lord. The presence of the Lord, where God's presence dwells, his courts, I long and I faint for his presence. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Was the last time your heart and flesh cried out for the living God the day you got saved, or has that cry grown since that day? Because it's supposed to be growing. The psalmist was creating space for God to show up through the cry of his heart, God, I I need your presence. I, I, I need your courts. Another place, he says, like the deer longs for water, my soul longs for your presence. As parents, you know, leading our kids, we, we, I think we need to teach them this principle at a young age, what it looks like to walk into church and to expect for more than just to learn about God. But kids, you're going to go to church today and you can actually experience God. you got to teach your kids this, right? What it, what it means to live a, with faith-filled expectation that God is going to show up and do something incredible in their lives, right? Another Sunday is here, right? And, and in seven days, inevitably, another one will be here, Lord willing. What if when we gathered together, we were all expecting anticipating for God to do something unbelievable and unprecedented, exceeding and abundant. I wonder what would happen if we walked through the doors of church believing this isn't just going to be an, another ordinary Sunday service, but I believe today could be an extraordinary encounter with God. Now, am I saying that if you walk into the house with a heart that's expecting that God's going to show up and manifest his presence in a way like he did in Acts every time. Is that what I'm saying? N no, not at all. This isn't, it's not a magic formula. As much as I just want to, as one of your pastors, challenge us, maybe we could change our hearts a little bit. 
Maybe we could change our hearts and, and, and push past the casual, just church goer and, and press into passionate God seeker a little bit more, right? My soul yearns, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh, they cry out for the living God. And when he shows up like he did in Acts, we were expecting it. And when he doesn't show up, we keep expecting it until he does. Right? What did you expect when you walked through the doors of church this morning? Right? And I, I'm primarily talking to Jesus followers here. And, and if you're here today and, and you, you're checking this out, and you don't, you, you're more than welcome here. Um, and we love you, and, and you don't have to behave to belong here. But this is kind of, for those who are following Jesus, I want to challenge you here. Okay? What did you expect when you walked into church today? Would it be the same thing that the New Testament church expected when they walked up the stairs into that loft apartment? Right? Because they got what they were expecting. And, and we will too. We will too. Our expectation is our preparation. It, it positions us to host the presence of God. Pastor Jason comes, I'm going to just close with this thought. Has this been okay this morning? You guys all right? A little bit different for me, but that's, it's okay. We have, me and my, personally, our family and our kids, we have so much value for this idea, this reality of the presence of God, because it is the thing, one of the primary things that has carried us year after year after year and brought restoration and healing time and time again. It's, it's, it's moments where, where he stands up in the room and he does what only he can do where he makes himself known. They're not just fun, cool Christian experiences. We actually get transformed when his presence begins to fill the room. As we close, in the Old Testament, there's a book called Second Chronicles. We find a guy, his name is Solomon, okay? This is none other than the son of the giant killer David, Solomon. Solomon in 2 Chronicles, he's in the process of building a great temple to host the presence of God. He's in the process, okay? Massive project, a giant undertaking. In today's market, Solomon's temple would have been somewhere near like a, a half a billion dollars. Solomon, he is the contractor uh, for this massive building project. He had to make sure the job was was done right. He was the one putting out fires and listening to employee complaints and making sure that the workers didn't take more than a 30-minute lunch break. He, he was the manager. Any contractor in here can know how taxing that is. He kept the project moving forward one step at a time. All that to say, Solomon put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into completing this temple for God. Right? And then... And only then, when all the work was completely done, the punch-out list was finally complete after all the I's were dotted, after all the T's were crossed, only then does Solomon say, now it's time, guys, go get the Ark of the Covenant, which represents the presence of God in the Old Testament. Only after all the work is done, now you can go get the presence. We're ready. Now check this out. Here's that moment. 2 Chronicles 5.11, the culmination. Solomon goes and brings the presence of God in, into the temple of God after it's all complete. Here's what happens. All the Levites who were mu musicians were there. Asaph, He-Man. He-Man was there, guys. This is going to be epic. Jedithan and their families, they were dressed in their worship robes. The choir and the orchestra assembled now remember the book of Acts. They assembled on the east side of the altar and were joined by 120 priests. Remember the upper room, the 120? They were blowing trumpets. The choir and the trumpets made one voice. Sounds like one mind, one accord, doesn't it? Of praise and thanks to God. Orchestra and choir, they were in perfect harmony, singing and playing praise to God. Yes, God is good. His loyal love, it just goes on forever. Verse 13, then they were creating an atmosphere, a place for God to dwell. Then 
a cloud filled the temple of God. The priest couldn't even carry out their duties because of the cloud. The glory of God filled the temple. In the Old Testament, notice that the presence of God, it filled, it filled the house last. After all the work was done, after all the I's were dotted, after all the T's were crossed. But in the New Testament, if you remember, the presence of God filled the house what? First. Why? Well, it's easy. It's because the work was already done through Jesus. All we have to do to access what's already available to us through Jesus It's not dot some more I's and cross some more T's and make sure you're perfectly put together. All we have to do if we are in Christ to access what's already available to us through Jesus is just get in position to receive it. Just get in position to receive it. Try it. Money back guarantee. Try it. See what happens. Try it. Right? Let's go on this journey together. To, be, uh, to becoming a church that is full of leaders that are the same quality as the leaders we find in the New Testament church and the Bible. That's our blueprint. It's not rainbow, it's, it's, it's not a, a beautiful unicorn. It, it's, it's, it should be our story right now. It's not a once upon a time story. It's, it should be our story now. It's challenging, isn't it? For me and you and everybody. But I think we can take some steps and move in the right direction, right? Going on a journey together, believing, expecting for God to stand up and do what only he can do. Amen? Go ahead and stand with me.